Sally Yates lectures Ted Cruz on how Trump can't refuse refugees. Said nothing when Obama refused refugees. Senator Ted Cruz grilled former NSA Director James Clapper and former Acting Attorney General Sally Yates on the unmasking of private citizens under surveillance by the U.S. government. During their back and forth, Yates told Senator Cruz, asked Yates about her decision to block the Trump temporary refugee ban from terror states. Yates said the president does not have the right to block refugees to America. Yates told Cruz no person shall receive preference or be dis, uh, discriminated against in issuance of a visa because of race, nationality, or birthplace. Is that so? According to Yates, then, the president cannot ban refugees from any country from entering the United States. I beg to differ. Of course, back in 2011, Sally Yates and Democrats said nothing when Barack Obama banned Iraqi refugees for six months from entering the U.S. As a result of this discovery, the Obama administration blocked all Iraqi refugees from entering the U.S. for six months. There were no protests. Sally Yates did not speak out then. The left said nothing. ABC reported as a result of the Kentucky case, the State Department stopped processing Iraq refugees for six months in 2011. Federal officials told ABC News even for many who had heroically helped U.S. forces as interpreters and intelligence assets, one Iraqi who had aided American troops was assassinated before his refugee application could be processed because of the immigration delays. Two U.S. officials said in 2011, fewer than 10,000 Iraqis were resettled as refugees in the U.S., half the number from the year before State Department statistics show. Sally Yates was attorney, uh, U.S. attorney for the Northern District of Georgia at the time. Yates was promoted to deputy attorney general in 2015. Let's take a listen to Ted Cruz first here. Whenever the president finds the entry of any alien or of any class of aliens into the United States, would be detrimental to the interests of the United States. He may, by proclamation, and for such period as he shall deem necessary, suspend the entry of all aliens or any class of aliens as immigrants or non-immigrants, or impose on the entry of aliens any restrictions he may deem appropriate. Would you agree that that is broad statutory authorization? I would, and I am familiar with that, and I'm also familiar with an additional provision of the INA that says no person shall receive preference or be discriminated against in issuance of a visa because of race, nationality, or place of birth. That, I believe, was promulgated after the statute that you just quoted. And that's been part of the discussion with the courts with respect to the INA, is whether this more specific statute trumps the first one that you just described. The, the, but my concern was not an INA concern here. It rather was a constitutional concern. Oh really? Now they're they're they they want to uh, know it's a constitutional concern. That's what their concern is. Too bad we can't send uh, Yates and Hillary down to Iraq. You know, since they they love them. Uh, this was after the U.S. discovered Al Qaeda terrorists living as refugees in Kentucky. Let's take a listen here. It's a bit of a long clip. An undercover FBI About operation exposes al-Qaeda terrorists posing as refugees in the middle of the American heartland. They quickly learn that lax background checks were to blame. But it turns out that's just the beginning. There may be dozens more now in this country as well. Really? Chief we're all surprised, Ryan mind Ross you. Got access to the undercover investigation for Nightline Investigates. This FBI surveillance video was made not in Afghanistan or in Iraq, but in Kentucky. It shows an admitted al-Qaeda terrorist who had already killed American soldiers in Iraq trying to get weapons to kill more of them. And authorities tell ABC News he may be just one of dozens of men with American blood on their hands 
who were mistakenly allowed to settle in the U.S. as refugees. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are many more than that. These are trained terrorists in the art of bomb making uh, that are inside the United States and, and quite frankly, uh, from a Homeland Security perspective, uh, that greatly concerns me. We're a laughing stock, that's all I have to say. Took place in We're a Holy laughing Green, stock. Kentucky, a city of 60,000 people, seemingly far removed from concerns about terrorists next door until these two men quietly moved in, Wad Alwan and Mohammed Hamadi. Of all places in the world, or all places in the United States, why Bowling Green? The two men came from Iraq four years ago, among tens of thousands of refugees, who the State Department approved to come here, seen as no threat to the U.S. Of course not, but they're not a threat. Attacks, says the FBI, part of an Al-Qaeda-connected insurgent group, that had already killed American soldiers with roadside bombs. Who produced this video of their attacks around the Iraqi city of Bosch. One bomb killed four members of the Pennsylvania National Guard on patrol in a Humvee in 2005, as Sergeant Joshua Hedit Nimi painfully recalls. It was a somber moment for the platoon. We had a great deal of love and respect for those guys, and it, it hit us pretty hard. Warrant Officer Dan South was the only one in the Humvee to survive the attack. Unless you smoke the guys that, that did it when it happened. Other than that, you never you never know who did it, you never know what happened to them. As far as you know, they got away with it scot free. And not just get away with it. An ABC News investigation found that the two terrorists, Awan and Hamadi, were able to get through a flawed U.S. system of background checks and end up in Bowling Green. One living in this public housing apartment on public assistance. Of course. 24 hour surveillance. That's where our taxpayer FBI dollars are going. When we realized we had a man here with uh, American Why shouldn't they collect? Of course. They're nice they, people. They took it to a whole new level for us. The other Iraqi lived in this residence near the high school. They're scared. And as the FBI would learn in the course of its undercover operation, the two Iraqis were intent on killing even more Americans. These two individuals specifically are, are innately evil. To be able to act no, as a terrorist, they're not to evil. And kill American soldiers, and then have the balls to come over to the United States. And of try course to do the they do. Bunch here, of idiots over here. We are acceptable. The investigation of Al Qaeda in Kentucky was launched based on an intelligence tip forwarded to the FBI's office in Louisville. And agents Keith Carpenter and Tim B. Anytime you have an Al Qaeda in Iraq operative in the U.S., it's going to be a surprise. At the prompting of an FBI informant who befriended the men, Alwan made these drawings of IEDs he said he made back in Iraq. And in undercover tapes of the informant, he boasted of building a dozen or more bombs and using a sniper's rifle to kill American soldiers in the Baji area. He said that he had them for lunch and dinner, and meaning that he had killed them. To hear him say that on the undercover tapes must have been chilling. It was gut-wrenching. But the big breakthrough in the case came out of this warehouse outside Washington, an FBI repository of virtually every IED or bomb used against American targets anywhere in the world. Well, this is basically America's bomb library. The remnants of some 100,000 bombs are stored in these boxes stacked to the ceiling here as part of a little-known FBI unit run by Gregory Carla. When you really stop and think about what's actually in those boxes is really what makes you pause thinking of all the troops that have been injured or wounded uh, by these devices, and uh, it really is kind of a sacred grounds. Based on the description the FBI undercover got from Alwa of the type and location of the bombs he said he had built, a team of 40 FBI agents and technicians were assigned to go through the remnants of some 130 bombs and do some 14,000 fingerprint comparisons. And then, two-thirds of the way through, Bingo. I think that I said you will never believe it. <laughs> a bomb that had been recovered outside Baji in this pile of rocks before it was detonated was the key. The the device? It matched in detail the drawing of a bomb Alon had given the undercover FBI informant. Well, he's got a lot of the, the chemistry, the explosive stuff here. I would call that pretty sophisticated. And better, as the lead FBI forensic specialist Katie Suchma and Stephen Mallow showed me, fingerprints and a palm print on the detonating device, a wireless phone base station matched those of Alwan in Kentucky. Yeah, you can see right here. Mm -hmm. And right there. Yep. What was that like when you, when you made the match? The whole team. team was ecstatic because it was um, like a finding a needle in a haystack. 
Word was sent back to Louisville. It was a, a surreal moment. I mean, it was a, a real game changer, so to speak, for the case, because now you have solidified proof that he was involved in actual attacks against U.S. soldiers. So this was somebody who was for real, not just full of uh, and exactly was right, for real, in our backyard. Scary? Yes. Yes. Uh, the reality of, of uh, it could happen in our backyard. Um, you know, whether it's Bowling Green, Washington, D.C., New York, it was here. As the case we have the liberals to thank for this, Iraqi and Congress. Sally Yates, and Clinton, Obama. Seen on undercover cameras, loading weapons they thought were going to be shipped to al-Qaeda in Iraq. In this picture, <laughs> uh, Mahan and Hamadi is holding one of the PKM machine guns that he believed that they were sending back to the al-Qaeda and Iraq forces to be used against the U.S. forces. Uh, in this picture, Wad al one is unloading a Stinger missile, uh, an air aircraft weapon that he believed was going to be able to be used against uh, U.S. aircraft. This one, both Wad and uh, Hamadi are loading a crate of C-4 explosives that they think is going back. So he was excited to be able to send this back to Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Absolutely. According to federal prosecutors, all one also wanted to target a U.S. Army captain back in the U.S. who had been assigned to the Baji area. They wanted to, uh, you know, assassinate, uh, you know, this particular U.S. captain. And prosecutors say Hamadi urged other attacks on U.S. soil. Quote, many things should take place and it should be huge, unquote. We were happy that uh, we were able to, you know, bring justice to uh, this individual that we knew that was involved in these kinds of acts uh, overseas. The two men were arrested in May 2011 and pleaded guilty to charges of providing material support to terrorists. Alwan was sentenced to 40 years in prison. Amadi was sentenced to life, which he is appealing. Honestly, I wish we could have smoked him when it happened, but you know, we didn't have that opportunity, so I guess this is the second best. But for all the success of the undercover operation, the case has raised the question of how the State Department and the Citizenship and Immigration Service allowed the men to get into the country in the first place. How do you have somebody that we uh, now know uh, was, was a known uh, actor in terrorism uh, overseas, how does that person uh, get into the United States? How do they get into our community? The system failed here, though. If you're asking my opinion, I would say the system failed. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been here in the first place. The two got here by filling out this Immigration Service refugee application form and simply checking no next to the boxes that asked if they had been involved in any form of terrorist activity. <laughs> they were approved what a joke. even though both men had been detained in Iraq for planting roadside bombs. And Alwan confessed to Iraqi authorities he was part of an insurgent group with his fingerprints actually in the Defense Department files years before he applied to come to the U.S., according to retired Lieutenant General Michael Barbero. You know, how did a person who we detained in Iraq link to an IED attack? We had his fingerprints in our a government system. How did he walk into America in 2009 and then, you know, at least two years later before he, he came up on our radar screen? At a congressional hearing, a Homeland Security official said none of that information was available to its screeners. And all the biographic as well as the biometric checks that were performed at the time did come back clean. Now an urgent search is underway at the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia, to go through a huge backlog of other bombs from Iraq and Afghanistan, with leads to a surprising number of other terrorists who also may have managed to move here undetected. We are currently supporting uh, dozens of current counterterrorism investigations like that. Dozens of cases? Correct. Where you're looking for prints of people who are in this country now? That's correct. That's quite a, quite a thing. It is, and I think that's what shows the, uh, the seriousness of all of this. The discovery of Al-Qaeda in Kentucky led to a six-month suspension of the refugee program, which has helped to resettle tens of thousands of legitimate refugees. The Immigration Service says it has now tightened security on background checks. In effect, closing the barn door after the fact. Yeah, and we can all sleep very comfortably knowing that they're on the job. Really? Really? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and thank you so much for watching.